Welcome to In Focus. Today, I want to talk to you about disclosure. Specifically, I want to talk to you about the ongoing disclosure of information regarding our relationship to technology from beyond this world, to life from beyond this world, and to contact uh, from that life uh, with us in the past and the present. And I have to be specific when I, I talk about disclosure. I was recently at an event there was a question that came up from the audience. I was on stage and someone asked me to speak about disclosure and a, a, someone else and a woman in another part of the office, she said, well, disclosure of what? And uh, was not aware of the efforts that are ongoing right now through the mass media to condition the population of the world to, uh, to accept the revelations that are now being made in one form or another of our relationship to uh, intelligence from, from beyond this world. It's a complex topic. It's not new. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. And this is one of the interesting things about disclosure. When I ask people, what are you expecting from disclosure? Uh, what we find is that for many people, it means the official acknowledgement of our relationship to intelligence from beyond this world. In other words, they, they want to see an acknowledgement, not just on BBC and CNN, but they want to see it from the Kremlin. They want to see it from the White House. I don't know that that's going to happen in that way. Disclosure itself has been happening for a long time on many different levels. And uh, just depends on, on what it is that you're expecting to see, what you believe in terms of what you're being uh, shown, because obviously there's a narrative around the disclosure, not just the fact that disclosure is happening, but how the narrative is being driven. So these are things I want to talk to you about today. What is disclosure? What does it mean? What are the implications? What's the big deal? I've had young people come up to me at some of our events and say, what is the big deal? You know, we all know that we're not alone in the universe. So, so let me just kind of break this down a little bit. Uh, first of all, the this will probably be part one of uh, at least a, a two-part series because there's so many facets of disclosure. And I think many of you know that for over 40 years of my adult life, I have been blessed to lead people into some of the most isolated and remote and pristine and magnificent and beautiful places remaining in the world today for the archaeological sites that we find there. Uh, but also because of the indigenous people that preserve the wisdom that we find in those archaeological sites. So I'll be clear, I have not been with every indigenous tradition, you know, everywhere on the planet. Every indigenous tradition that I have ever been with allows for a relationship uh, between them, their people, their communities, and a greater family in the cosmos, what they call their space family, their space brothers and sisters or whatever. And it's it's more than just a reference to them. There's an interaction that happens, especially when I go into the Andes of southern Peru, uh, spend a lot of time leading groups into the um, Tibetan plateau, the 12 monasteries and two nunneries over 26 days, uh, and the, the Tibetan people, among others. And the point is that they all allow for these relationships uh, between us and a greater intelligence, an ongoing relationship that began a long time ago. It's only in the West where we in the past may have had a problem. And I say in the past because uh, I believe that we are in the process of being conditioned. We have been since I was a kid of, uh, of accepting uh, on a deeper level our relationship to intelligence from beyond this world. You know, I, if you're old enough to remember, I mean, some of the first science fiction programs that came out in the late 50s and early 60s, you know, on black and white television and some of the first Star Treks that came out and uh, Lost in Space, you know, with uh, an AI intelligent robot uh, that used to wave his arms around and say, danger, Will Robinson, danger, Will Robinson, you know, and, and we laugh about those, but those were early, um, early efforts to begin conditioning the general population to think differently about ourselves and our relationship with the world. And so you say, well, why would we need to think differently? Well, I'm going to begin with that. It all comes down to there were a couple of studies that were done um, 
they were done back in the early 1960s, and then they were published later, later in the 60s, about what it would mean to us. How would it impact society and civilization to know that we're not all that there is, that the world doesn't revolve around us, that, that there's something else out there? And a, a couple of these think tanks, they, they did some really interesting research. One of them is the RAND Corporation. I know some of you are familiar with with them. Another one is the Brookings Institute. The, the RAND Corporation, these are uh, private organizations. And I, I'm looking over here. I don't have a formal PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to reference some notes for accuracy, and I want to give you some direct quotes. I wanted to put this out quickly so that uh, we could build on this because of some of the things that are happening in the news cycles that are coming around over the next few days, next couple of weeks. I wanted Wanted that you to have a little bit of a context from my my perspective because you've asked for that. So these are, are private uh, think tanks, private corporations that consult with uh, with the authorities, with U.S. military, with governments all, all over the world. And the Rand Corporation uh, was interesting because when they were asked about their positions, they denied uh, that they had done any work or any reference or any acknowledgement of uh, uh, intelligence from beyond our world. And finally, through uh, enough asking, and I think it's through freedom of information could have played a role in this, they acknowledged an internal memo. It was dated uh, November 27, 1968, where they uh, developed a memo and uh, it was uh, um, based, it was broken down into a number of different parts. Part five, is actually called UFOs, How to Proceed and Why. So it shows us the RAND Corporation was looking into this, and they gave all kinds of scenarios uh, about what could happen and if these things happened, what it would mean. It was kind of like a fault tree. If this, then that. If this, then that. So I'm just sharing this because it, it goes to show they were being asked to explore this and to think about it. I think the really important one, probably the one that had the, the greatest impact, was from the, um, the Brookings Institute. This is from 1962, and I'm going to read uh, directly from this. I want to get this right. And what they were doing, the Brookings, Brookings Institute, was taking case histories from anthropological studies here on Earth. What did it mean to societies that had been cut off from the rest of the world. So these are tribes that were, and again, this is back in the 60s. And these were new tribes that were being found in uh, primarily in South America and Africa or in the, the Pacific on islands that had been cut off from uh, uh, you know the rest of the world. And by being cut off, this is the important thing, that uh, they were absolutely certain of their place in the world and of their place in the cosmos. They had a very they were very entrenched in an idea of who they were and where they they were and with relation to the rest of the cosmos now we're not cut off from one another but as a society this applies to us we have been conditioned to be very certain very human centric about who we are and our relationship to the world now there have always been people and maybe in your family and certainly in my family you know we've always acknowledged uh that you know the universe is a big place and as Carl Sagan said, it would be a terrible waste of space if, if we're all that there is, and we know that they're not. As a scientist, uh, I have studied the archaeological, the anthropological uh, evidence, the, the fossil records, and I'm going to begin talking about those in some of the other, other programs. Uh, so I've always been very open to the idea, and for me, I, I, it wasn't a problem. It's never been a problem for me, but let me share with you why it was a problem uh, according to people at the Brookings Institute, and how this thinking led to the the hiding of information that was coming out in, in the 20th century. So here's a direct quote from the Brookings Institute. It says, anthropological files contain many examples of societies that were sure of their place in the universe. So this is what I was just mentioning, which have disintegrated when they have had to associate with previously unfamiliar societies espousing different ideas and different life ways, others that survived such an experience. So some of them disintegrated. They just, they ceased to exist as a society. 
those that did continue their societies, those that survived such an experience usually did so by paying a very high price of changes in values and attitudes and behaviors. So this is the, the official thinking back in the 1960s when it comes to the, the public revelation of what was happening with crash sites, with recoveries, not just in the United States, but these were happening all over the world. Recently, we're finding as far back as 1933, uh, a, a vehicle, um, an extraterrestrial vehicle had crashed in Italy during the, the rule of Mussolini and was given to the US because of our, our relationship with them at the time and the, the technical expertise. Uh, in the the cultural traditions of all those places that I mentioned previously, from the Andes Mountains and the Tibetans, they've always had uh, records, written records, oral traditions, and in some cases have actually harbored uh, the occupants of the vehicles that have crashed or landed on Earth among the indigenous populations. And they have learned from them and communicated with them over a period of many years and develop their cosmology based upon those relationships. So I'm going to talk about that more in, uh, in another video. What I want to talk to you about right now is the disclosure itself, the way it's happening, how it's being presented to us, and what it may mean, and what the concerns are uh, about that. So there is a process. It's a concerted process that is uh, becoming a little bit more apparent, certainly in the news cycles recently, and I, I say recently because as far back, some of you remember, I mean, for me, the, the first really high level official disclosure, there were always rumors and there were uh, whistleblowers and there were leaks, you know, all through from World War II uh, and development of nuclear weapons, you know, up into the present. That, that's always been happening. The, the first really official acknowledgement was in the year 2013, and this was at the uh, the National Press Club, the... It was called the Citizen Hearings on UFO Disclosure. Stephen Greer, I mean, if you know who Stephen Greer is, I interviewed with him for a film that he uh, did last year. Interestingly, uh, he and his staff felt that my part of the interview did not fit into the film, so it wasn't included. But uh, I interviewed with him. They, they came to me here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'm saying this because I had the opportunity to spend uh an evening with Stephen Greer and talked to him very interesting very interesting guy very interesting perspectives he was the one that was driving this um, national press club largely driving the the national press club um that happened in 2013 so what happened there well it was just that national press club uh representatives from many different publications came to hear the testimony under oath of retired military of engineers of scientists uh, from around the world who had had the experiences and seen the evidence. Uh, and during the time, and again, it was a different time, World War II, mid 20th century, the Cold War was happening, and many of them were under non-disclosure agreements. So they had signed documents saying, you can't talk about this stuff. Uh, having worked in the defense industry during the Cold War, I, I know exactly what this is. All of our jobs were very compartmentalized. In other words, I was working on software, and I had no idea what my software was being used for. We would receive, a, a code. my team, we would receive uh, a, a section of software, of code. We didn't know what had happened prior to that, and we didn't know where our code was going to go. Our job was to take the input and make that input perform in a certain way for output. And then it went to another team in another isolated uh, compartment. They were called vaults and they, they literally were vaults. Uh, uh, so very compartmentalized and that's how you keep secrets. And it, and it works actually very well. And the, so a lot of the, the people that were testifying had been in compartmentalized projects where they had either seen directly or they had heard from other people that were working with them, you know, on these projects on the military bases and things like that. So that was 2013. And, you know, uh, it just kind of fell where it fell. The national media really didn't pick it up. You didn't hear much about it on mainstream legacy 
cable network news, or if you did, it was uh, poked fun at. It, there were there were jokes, late night TV, little green men, you know, all the jokes that you ex just trying to discount the, the whole thing and, and uh, shed doubt on the credibility of what was happening here. Things kicked into high gear in 2021, September of 21. The Department of Defense, DOD, released actual footage. Now we're moving from the point of just speaking about it. Now we're actually seeing something, although still no physical data uh, other than the visual. So it's more than oral testimony. So the DOD released uh, the footage uh, of a, uh, it was a UAP. They changed it from UFO. And now it's been renamed to UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. And uh, that was September of 21. And then there was a period of time where the dust kind of settled from that. It was assimilated. It was whatever it was. Now we go into high gear. April of 23, the Pentagon now is releasing uh, additional footage of two UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. That's April of this year. Now May, the next month, May 18th, uh, Gary Nolan, Stanford scientist, comes out and he states in mainstream media confirms that non-humans have visited the earth. Now, our indigenous ancestors have always said that, but this is someone uh, that is believed to be credible in the academic world, in the scientific world, uh, is, is saying this, and it is being picked up on mainstream media. You are seeing this across the legacy media. Okay, that's May 18th, June 3rd, Newsweek, comes out okay now it gets official if it's on the cover of a magazine it's official okay newsweek uh comes out and says an intel officer christopher mellon <clears throat> has stated that these things are happening and that reverse engineering so he's saying reverse engineering has happened what does that mean reverse engineering is when we have a technology and we tear it apart to figure out how it works so that we can recreate that technology that's the reverse engineering you tear it down and you have to understand all the components. And if those components are based on technologies that aren't known yet, it can take years to understand how those components are working. Uh, so you are going from a finished product backward to understand the nature of the mechanism. Now you can recreate this. So what Mellon is saying is that reverse engineering has happened. He's saying, and it should be made public. And the, the reason for this, and this is one of the, the implications, is because presumably the technology that we find in vehicles that come from another world, that, that world, whether it's from another world in this solar system, so local, or beyond this solar system, it's going to take a long time to get here. And they're not using internal combustion engines. These aren't, you know, eight cylinder V8s. They're not rocket engines, liquid fuel, solid fuel rocket engines. These are working on the physics that the mainstream academia are not teaching. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it is a physics that has been known and is taught to selected, um, selected people who are chosen to work on selected projects. I remember when, uh, when I was in, um, when I was in the industry during uh, defense industry during during Cold War, they I know they would recruit. Uh, people who excelled in mathematics at, at universities, uh, you know, high high end universities, and if they did really well in conventional math, then they'd be recruited to work for governmental agencies. And there is another math that uh, they would be privileged to uh, to learn, and then to apply that math in in technologies that aren't, aren't commonly acknowledged. So that's what's happening with. Uh, with Newsweek, June 3rd, and then the big, the really big one that everyone, let's just put this on the map, everybody's talking about this now, June 6th in 2023, David Grush. Uh, he was, he well, he was uh, a very credible intel officer, had a lot of security clearances, had worked, he was a former uh, military, U.S. Air Force, I believe, a lot of credibility, uh, went on mainstream uh, through testimony under oath. Uh, congressional testimony uh, that the U.S. is two things in possession. Uh, well, first, has a secret crash recovery program. Number one. Number two is in possession of non-human aircraft or non-human craft. And number three, in possession of non-human uh, bodies, biological 
uh, uh, recovery. So this is kind of where things are right now. And you can see that this is, it's not spontaneous. This is a directed rollout. Some people are calling this a, a soft uh, disclosure rather than boom, just coming out one day and saying, we interrupt this program, you know, for a special, like they do in the, in the movies, for a special report. And you see, you know, the Kremlin in Moscow and the president in, in the White House and leaders in all over the world simultaneously making this announcement. That hasn't happened. And, and I don't know, again, that it will, because that would be a hard disclosure. This is soft disclosure where it's coming out uh, kind, I believe, for a couple of reasons, soft disclosure. One, I think it is testing the public to see how the public responds to this. Uh, and number two, there appear to be different camps that have different visions and different agendas regarding disclosure, if it should happen at all. There's some that still don't want it to happen. Uh, younger people are now coming in to those uh, those jobs and, and those careers that have, have kept a lot of the secret and older ones who signed those non-disclosures, including some of the former astronauts who signed the non-disclosures saying, you know, we can't talk about what we experienced on lunar surface. We can't talk about what happened when we were at the space station. Our pilots say, you know, we can't talk about what happened on our reconnaissance missions. All of them believing that those non-disclosures were temporary. That surely, I mean, the astronauts, uh, and I've had the opportunity to tour and, and to speak with and to know some of the former astronauts, and they all felt, you know, it was the Cold War years. It was a different time. So disclosures were okay. Surely, by the end of their lifetimes, something this big would be made known because of the implications. It wasn't. And so now they are dying they're on their deathbeds and they don't want to take the secret to the grave so some of them in their you know last days or last hours of life are revealing you know what it is that uh this happened i mean can you imagine can you imagine the having a direct experience that could change forever the lives of every man woman and child on the face of the earth having that as a military man or a woman so you're under oath and you're you know, you're on your mission and being for, the, forbidden from sharing something like this when you see the world in the condition that the world is in right now and how this information could help the world and, and change the world in, in truly beautiful ways. Uh, emotionally, what would that mean? And there are all kinds of stories. I had the opportunity uh, from a conference at one time, I was leaving a conference going back to the airport, and I was sharing a van uh, with a lot of women, and I didn't know who those women were, and it was a long drive back to from uh, the city where the conference was back to the airport. And so we started talking, and they were astronauts' wives, and apparently there was something called the Astronauts' Wives Club, where they come together and console and comfort and support one another in, in difficult missions. And they were sharing among themselves what they had seen their husbands go through emotionally and psychologically, because most of them were not trained. This is a part of the training the military doesn't do a lot of. Uh, emotionally, what do you do with that kind of information? And sadly, there are stories, and we've all heard this. This isn't a secret. I mean, it's very public. Many of them turn to drugs and uh, alcohol to to help uh, desensitize them from the emotional pain and the, the mental pain and the psychological pain of not being able to share these extraordinary experiences, even with, they weren't supposed to share them with anyone, even with their spouses. So, so I, I had the opportunity to hear some of those, uh, some of those stories. So the disclosure, we're in it, uh, it's happening. And it has been happening. It's just happening on a little bit different level now. I want to talk about a couple of different implications. Let me begin with the technological implication. We uh, we often hear about, uh, although you know there are records of our interaction, the archaeological, anthropological, cultural records of our interaction with intelligence from beyond this world that go back thousands of years. It wasn't happening in the technological society that we have right now. So when we have those interactions in a technological society, 
it means something different. It means that we can up-level our technology. And that's exactly what began to happen. If you remember uh, back in the ninth, if you're old enough to remember back in the, in the 50s and 60s, I, many of you know, I'm, I'm just giving an example, I'm a musician. And uh, when I'm not doing what I'm doing now, and I remember my guitar amplifier in the late 1950s and early 1960s, when I'd put that amplifier on a stage and it was dark, behind that amp was lit up with this, this soft uh, violet glow from the vacuum tubes that were called, and some of you musicians will know this, they're called 6L6 power vacuum tubes in, uh, in the back of the amplifiers in the head of, for example, a big silver tone amplifier or something like that, because we were still living in the age where everything was running on vacuum tubes. Young people have never seen, young people today, I've been in audiences, they have no idea what a vacuum tube is. They've never seen them because we live in a world of miniaturized uh, components and printed circuits. And those are the result of reverse engineering in the 1950s and 60s that was happening from technology that was coming to this world. It either crashed or been brought down or uh, landed intentionally, but was kept uh, secret, kept under wraps. And it, it's really interesting how quickly we made that leap from vacuum tubes and, and the mysteries of life. And all of a sudden, we had insights into DNA. All of a sudden, we had insights into miniaturized technology, uh, microcircuits, uh, transistors, resistors, capacitors without the vulnerability of those, of those vacuum tubes. And this is one of the implications. So one of the concerns, people say, well, what, what would it mean if we had that disclosure? There's the technological implication. The moment that we have this disclosure, that we have technology from other intelligence other civilizations, either other planets or other star systems, more likely. And it's not based on the burning of something to release the energy. All of our energy is based on we burn something uh, that has captured sunlight, either it's coal or it's wood or it's, uh, you know, the, the fossil fuels or whatever it is. But we have to, to destroy something to capture the energy to drive whatever it is we're going to, to be driving, turbines for electricity, you know, or automobiles or, you know, whatever it is. Presumably the technology that has brought an intelligent form of life from another star system, it's not going to be based on that. It's going to be based upon fundamental principles of physics, drawing energy from the very foundation of the field that underlies all existence something called the Planck field, named after Max Planck, the physicist, the early 20th century. And this is no secret. Uh, again, we know this, and physicists work, work with this. Tiny fluctuations uh, on the quantum level that can be captured, and those fluctuations, those movements, can be harnessed and, uh, and amplified into meaningful forms of, of energy. The moment we do that, we no longer, I mean, think about what that means. We no longer need a fossil fuel. We don't need nuclear power. We don't need natural gas. We don't need uh, gasoline in the tanks of our cars. We don't need to burn wood. We no longer need power lines to carry energy across our society, across our, our communities, our nations, our, our planet, under the oceans. Communication changes. Industries will change. And for some people, that change is frightening. And it's frightening because they're looking at it from a perspective of loss. Uh, and that is one perspective based in fear. There are other perspectives. Yes, it would change the industry. It would open the door to new industries, new technologies. So what that would mean, for example, uh, everyone would have a device sitting in your home somewhere and in a closet somewhere. And that device would be powering everything in your home with no wires not plugged into the wall. It doesn't need to be renewed because it's drawing on the Planck vacuum, the, the uh, infinite supply of, of energy that we, we have uh, available to us today. Uh, the same with an automobile. Automobiles would have a little gadget. They're about this big, the ones, the, the prototypes that I've seen that would sit in, you know, somewhere in the trunk of the car or under the hood or, or wherever it is. 
there would be no fuel. You would still need uh, you would still need fossil fuels for the other six thousand applications in our daily lives that are based upon fossil fuels. We simply would no longer be burning it. So, if we're really concerned about climate change, if for those that really believe that CO2 is driving the climate change, even though the science, the, the peer-reviewed science doesn't support that, maybe contributing, it's not the cause. And we can say that because the climate change uh, would be here even if humans were not here. We can see that in the geologic record. And if you believe that humans are the cause of that CO2, which also isn't supported uh, in, by the, the science, I talk about this in the other videos, but if you really believe those things, I would think you would want this energy. You you would want the disclosure to, to reveal this kind of energy. But ultimately, in a world where we are seeing the effort to remake the world, the great reset, to consolidate power, to centralize power uh, of energy and electricity, to centralize finances, to centralize government, to centralize food production, a source of energy like this would do just the opposite. It would free us from the bonds and the shackles of the fear and the control of those who want to have power over the masses. And uh, it would free humankind for the first time, I think in 5,000 years of recorded human history, making energy available to every man, woman, and child that wants it. There are indigenous communities that don't want energy. I've, I've visited with them and I respect that, but those that want it, and it would unleash innovation and imagination and creativity to begin building a world that we all know is possible in our hearts, uh, we would see that in our lives. And that is one of the implications, one of the beautiful implications. Stephen Greer has released a film recently uh, called The Lost Century, saying we, we could have had these possibilities uh, between 70 and 100 years ago because that's how long we've had the technology. So when this disclosure happens, this is one of the, the implications, the, the technological implications. Another implication is social implication, and this is what the, um, uh, the Brookings Institute was talking about. What does it mean to society when we think, man, we're, we're it, and you know, all of a sudden we find out we're maybe a little it in the presence of, of a much bigger it? What does that mean? Well, interestingly, the Catholic Church has had to come to terms with this, and I've I have um, I have a statement from them. Very interesting. The Jesuits, I think many of you know, are the scientific arm of uh, of the Catholic Church. The Jesuits had a a conference uh, and released a, a paper. What would the existence of intelligent intelligent extraterrestrials would it be consistent with Catholic belief? I think the question is funny. Are you going to have an unintelligent extraterrestrial? I mean, <laughs> if they're here from somewhere else, they're obviously very intelligent. You know, our civilization, you think about this, civilization, we're told, began about 5,000 years ago. That's this cycle of civilization. Technology is only, science is only about 300 years old. Who or whatever it is that's coming to visit us presumably has been around much, much longer Look at what we've accomplished in 300 years and, and then take that to the level. What would it mean if you, for a thousand years, which is nothing, or 5,000 or 10,000 years of a civilization in terms of AI, artificial intelligence, holographic projections, uh, longevity, healing, I mean, all those things. So with the, the Catholic Church, their official stance, I'm going to read, um, uh, read this to you directly. It says, the discovery of life on other worlds would not at all be inconsistent with Catholic belief, since it reflects the ability of the Creator to establish creatures wherever and whenever He wishes. So they're saying that if they're not saying it's out there, they're saying if we find it, it's not a problem for Catholic tradition because the Creator, one Creator, uh, can create life anywhere. Uh, there are some other religious institutions now that believe that beings are coming to our world to be uh, to be saved um, from whatever tradition they have, because uh, our religion and the religion that, that these people have been in, indoctrinated into leads them to believe that this is the only place 
that uh, where that can happen. So it's really interesting. You see some of the, the social implications uh, that are, are happening here. So socially, uh, what would that mean? And I, I think it would mean that the superpowers that have called themselves superpowers in the past are maybe not as super as, uh, as they would like themselves to believe. Uh, it's interesting because most of the disclosure is coming through military channels. And my concern regarding that is that the military has viewed the the craft that they cannot account for some of the craft in the footage are ours we have reversed engineered them we're flying them our pilots know how to fly them i personally have seen one of these in, in north i've seen more than one but i've seen one uh, up very close in northern new mexico and uh absolutely certain it was ours didn't make a sound didn't move fast just you know very really really interesting this was back in the in the late 90s so uh the the concern is that from a military perspective the what's happening in the news is is we're being told there are things in our skies that we don't know what they are but don't worry because we'll protect you so the military is is taking a stance at least publicly that uh looking at this as a threat honestly my perspective is if if you've come from a civilization either a star system away or even planets away and you've got the power to be here you've got the technology if you were ever going to hurt the people of the earth it could have happened anytime you know over the last 200,000 years that's how long we've been here i don't think they're coming to to hurt us uh that's my my perspective now there are there's indications that there and our ancestors tell us there are multiple intelligences and some of them are more benevolent than others some of them it's not that they're um that they're mean it is that they are very goal oriented and if their goal is you know to find a planet to live on then it may be that uh if there's anything standing between them and that goal they have the means to to remedy that so I, I think we're looking at uh, more, and again, as a, as a scientist, I'm sharing it with you from the scientific perspective, uh, my personal feeling, my personal understanding from dealing with indigenous people is we are dealing with, with multiple intelligences from other worlds because Earth is a really interesting place for a lot of reasons. And one of those is because of our biology. And that leads me to the, the third implication, the biological implication we we have bodies uh i native americans here in northern new mexico have found living survivors and they lived with them according to their reports i did not meet them personally but according to their reports reports and they live with them and they learned from them uh and while they are biologically not human as we would call a human they are dna based and our dna through our dna we have to have a common ancestor there's a common ancestry that's seeded DNA in this cosmos. And uh, so there is a relationship, maybe a distant, distant cousin, but they have two arms, they have two legs, they have two eyes. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they uh, apparently from the autopsies, their in, internal organs function a little bit differently, but they do have lungs, they do breathe oxygen. So even though they're not us exactly, we are similar enough that we have a, a common ancestor somewhere a long time ago. And there's a whole story that we can go into behind that. So what does that mean? If they have been around for hundreds of years, what does that mean to the implications for healing and the implications for longevity? And those have implications in industries that exist today, the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and all of these things. So so there, we're seeing, uh, we're living in this time where we're seeing pushback from the old guard. We're seeing young people that want to embrace the new information. This is happening in politics. Uh, I remember uh, I live in the state of New Mexico again. Our governor, Bill Richardson, was a governor from what years? From 2003 to 2011, Bill Richardson. And one of the things that he did when he became governor is his, uh, the story goes, he didn't tell me this personally, but the story is that his wife asked him to look into this and see if there was any truth to what had happened in Roswell, New Mexico. It's our, our state here. 
back in uh, in the mid 1940s and he ran up against a, a, a brick wall he could not find he wasn't given access to that information some of our former presidents wanted to come forward with it and things happened in their administrations uh, that sidetracked them from being able to do that so the point is that we are living a time now where the technology that we have <clears throat> will be deeply influenced by disclosure that was not the case 300 years ago you know or or maybe even a hundred years ago per se, uh, not the way it is right now. And our society will be deeply influenced by disclosure in terms of the, the consolidation of power, the centralization of control levied by fear. Because I, I think what will happen is when the disclosure happens at the level that we suspect this is going that we're going to think of ourselves differently we will one of two things will happen we either have to deny that we are part of a greater community and then you don't have to deal with it so there's an old saying uh, denial is a big river in egypt <laughs> and there's some people that will do that some people uh will be so locked into their either religious or spiritual doctrine that they will resist the implications a lot of people i think will be open to the implications and the power structures that are alive and well and bustling in our world today that are all jockeying for power you can see this happening they're jockeying for the best position as the world goes into the great shift the great reset uh, geologically, there are things uh, happening now and in our near future. Climatologically, things are happening now and in our near future that uh, are very different from what we've lived in the past. And there's a jockeying for positions of power and control. And disclosure is going to be a part of that. And I think it's up to us. It's up to us in terms of how we accept it in our lives. So I am going to invite you to do your own due diligence. Look into this. Look into it from beyond the mainstream media because that is the narrative that's being directed. Okay, there's a narrative out there. Seven corporations own all the major media uh, in the West, including Sky News, BBC, PBS, NPR, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, uh, MSN. I mean, all of it is different as they look to us on the outside there is a, a common thread. And when a narrative is driven, you will hear the words and the language identical throughout all of these. And this is happening with disclosure. So I'm going to invite you to go beyond. I mean, it's interesting to watch it, certainly. And there's some good independent sources that you can see in social media, media, social media, kinds of media. I'm going to invite you to go into your heart because there is a neural network of about 40,000 sensory neurites in every human heart discovered in 1991 and although we've been conditioned away from using this reliably in the modern world this was a foundation for our ancestors it's a foundation for indigenous traditions all over the world it's a foundation for deep intuition it is a foundation for uh the coherence between the heart and the brain that gives us access to our own biology so that we can self-regulate our immune system and our longevity enzymes and super memory and super learning and super cognition and resilience to change and all of that begins in the heart and you know i've talked about in all the other videos i don't want to be redundant here i'm going to invite you to go into your heart when you hear what it is that's happening and uh, and i think this is going to be really important because if we are given a reason to fear our relationship to uh, intelligence beyond our world. If we're given that reason, the question is, it's our choice in terms of how we respond to that fear. And ultimately, I think this is what disclosure is going to, to do with each of us. It's going to drive us to come to terms with who we are in this world, who we are in the cosmos, who we are spiritually, uh, and what a deeper relationship with intelligence from beyond our lives can mean to us. And we're all going to have different answers to that. But the way we answer that individually is going to determine collectively how we move forward with what is now being called disclosure. So in uh, uh, part two, I want to talk more about our indigenous relationship with intelligence from beyond this world. My direct experience 
with Indigenous people who actively communicate and receive healings from uh, what they call their star family on a, on a regular basis. And what we see in the archaeological record, what we see uh, new discoveries in the archaeological record, what we see in the anthropological record, what we see in the DNA record. So I'll do that in a separate video in the interest of time. For now, hope this helps uh, a little bit, maybe to put some context into what's happening in disclosure. It's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening within the context of all the things we're talking about, the Great Reset and the, the climate shifts and everything else that's going on. And so I think we have to look at it from that perspective. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I'm enjoying thinking of you as I'm looking into the camera and having it with you right now. Let me know in the comments how you feel about this. Uh, thank you for your love and support. Stay tuned. I look forward to our next.